4. Jimmy read the verse this morning. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Verse 36 says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And then again, in the book of Hebrews, please. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. Verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him Consider him. You may be seated. The last time I preached behind Brother Jimmy was in Florida a couple of years ago. And he brought a message on missions. And I tried to preach after he got done, and it was a complete failure because the Lord had so stirred the hearts of his people. And I'm not going to attempt to finish the message on Elijah this morning that I begun yesterday, and not even try to preach. But I just want to share a couple of verses with you, these verses. As Brother Jimmy began to preach this morning, God spoke to my heart afresh and anew. He that soweth and he that reapeth will receive wages and be able to rejoice together. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, for consider him, consider Jesus. The Word of God says that he endured the cross. He despised the shame, but he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him. And as I begin to think about what Brother Jimmy was saying this morning and our responsibility as a Christian, and I doubt that there's anybody in here that believes more deeply in the sovereignty of a holy God than I do. But I can also hear the words of Jesus as he looks over Jerusalem. He says, Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you together? I think about my life before I met Christ. I think about the faithfulness of the saints of God carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to me. For God, the Holy Ghost, deal with my heart. Bring me to Jesus. Save me. Set me upon a solid rock. 
Think about my sins being forgiven. Think about belonging to him. Think about the home that he's prepared me in heaven. Think about the life that he's given me in this world. You can say what you want to say, believe what you want to believe, but I believe that God's passion is for souls. God cares about people. There's boys and girls and men and women around this world in your community and in our community that are dying and perishing without Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I heard a man sing a song one time, Brother Jack, and the song said, With Jesus in the daddy's heart, there's a happy, happy home. Happy, happy home. With Jesus in the mama's heart, there's a happy, happy home. With Jesus in the children's heart, there's a happy, happy home. The reason why we can sit here with such great joy today is because of Jesus. Consider him. The reason that our homes have been put back together, all of us could stand and testify that our homes and our lives have been put back together is because of Jesus. Consider him. Whether their skin is black, whether their skin is white, whether their skin is brown, whether their skin is yellow, there's divided homes around the world. And the only way and the only reason They'll ever have a united home and heart is because of Jesus, consider him. What makes us one is not what we all agree upon in our own theology, but what we agree upon about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. There's differences of opinions. There's differences in convictions. There's differences in the way we live our life and the areas we come from. But what makes us all the same here today is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to consider him for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross but despised the shame. Do you think for one moment that Jesus Christ enjoyed the shame of the cross? Him, the sinless Lamb of God, the incarnate God, the one who'd come to live amongst us, and the one who'd come, virgin-born, to pay the price for man's sin. He'd raise the dead, and he'd heal the sick, cause the blind to see, cause the lame to walk, cause the lepers to be made whole. Every place he did, he did good. He was the Son of God. He was the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of grace, redemption, and atonement robed in human flesh, lived a perfect life, defeated sin, held death in the grave for you and I consider him. Amen. The religious crowd hated him. His disciples forsook him. And one day they took the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Even the physical suffering, we need to consider him. They brought Jesus into the courtyard, gave him a kangaroo court. And then those Roman soldiers took out the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, the giver of life, the one whom everything was created for and by, the only one who was able to put those Roman soldiers' life together and give them what nobody could ever give them, life eternal, forgiveness of sin. And they took him and turned him one toward the other and buffeted him in the face and buffeted him again. Put a handkerchief or a scarf over his eyes and run him into somebody else and buffet him again. Jesus not knowing when the blow was going to come and they'd buffet him again and he'd just walk into another fist of a big cruel Roman soldier. And then they took that crown of thorns and planted it on his brow, deep into his brow, so that I understand from reading different books that his, 
head must have been swollen out of proportion, blood mingling down into his face, spit upon the Son of God, spit upon the Son of God, the one who is going to go to the cross and die for the very ones that spit upon him. They spat in his face again and again and took that reed and began to whip him and began to beat him and took him and tied him to a post and scourged him with a cat of nine tails and ripped his back wide open. The flesh pulled from the bones. And then they took him and they nailed him to that cross. I, I am amazed at some of the artists conception of the Lord Jesus on the cross. I'm amazed at some of the ways that artists paint Christ crucified on the cross. Kind of like the only stars were in his hands and the only stars were maybe a few in his forehead. There they have a pictured just a Jesus hanging on the cross that has uh, just got kind of an angelic face. But Isaiah said... That when Jesus was on the cross, that his visage was marred beyond recognition. What did God says? No man would have been able to recognize him. His face was blown up beyond proportion, cut open, his back torn open, nailed to a cross. No telling how big his head was swelled up by this time. His visage was marred beyond recognition. But, beloved, we need to consider him and all that he went through for you and I. Not only the physical suffering, that really in itself was the least, even though it was severe, it was the least of his sufferings. The rest I don't understand. I can't understand with my finite mind how this began to happen. Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross that day. And as he was there on that cross, and everybody had forsook him, I can see now the angels of glory looking down at the Lord Jesus Christ, looking down at the Prince of Heaven, looking down at the Son of God with their swords drawn and saying, Oh, Father, just give us a word and we'll rescue him. I want you to know Jesus could have called 10,000 angels that day to swoop down and pull him off that cross, but he didn't do it. Who crucified Jesus? You say the Romans did. You say the Jews did. You say we did. I want you to know who killed Jesus. The Word of God says no one killed Jesus. He said, I've got power to lay my life down. I've got power to take it up. No one takes my life from me. He was God rolled in human flesh. Willingly. He submitted himself to the cross. Willingly, he went to the cross, mocked and scourged and spat upon, spat upon. The Son of God spat upon. God spat upon. Man in his wickedness, man in his gall and iniquity, man in his ungodliness, spat upon God. And on that cross, I don't understand it. But Isaiah again say that it pleased God to reach down and smote him. That God reached down from heaven when Jesus was on that cross and smote him. Why? He endured the cross, but he despised the shame. It was shame. Cursed is he that hangeth upon a cross. It was shame. Adam, because of his sin and his willful sin, became a sinner. But Jesus, because of obedience, became the sin bearer. And he bore your sins and he bore my sins. And I believe he bore the sins of the whole world in his body that day on the tree. Consider him. As Brother Jimmy began to speak again this morning, God, the Holy Ghost, began to stir my heart. I knew it would be almost flippant to try to preach anything else. God's passion is for souls. 
He endured the cross, but despised the shame. Why did he endure the cross? I don't understand how that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had had fellowship all through eternity past. I don't understand how that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? My God the Father, my God the Holy Spirit, why hast thou forsaken me? And God turned his back on Jesus on the cross that day when Jesus Christ was paying the price for sin for you and I and every other man, woman, boy, or girl that has ever or will ever live. Jesus was making atonement. I heard Dr. George Truett say one time on an old record, preaching to his congregation, he said on the back side of Dallas, there's a boy, there's a girl, nameless and faceless, he said, but I would have you to know this day that if you were to take their little soul and put it on one side of a scale and take all the wealth and all the gold and all the prosperity in Dallas and in Fort Worth and in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma and Kentucky, Washington, Michigan, all of the New England states and the northern states and the western states, Take all the silver and gold of Canada, of Great Britain, all the silver and gold of Asia, South America, Red China, Russia, and all the Scandinavian countries. Take all the gold and the wealth of a million worlds and put it on the other side of that scale. Dr. Truett said, I would have you to know, dear people, that that one precious soul of that one boy and that one girl would outweigh all the silver and gold of a million worlds. For what would it profit a man? if he gained the whole world and lost his soul. God's passion is for souls. Jesus' passion is for souls. For consider him. We give, but we don't give enough. I'm talking about me. I'm, ta I'm not saying about, I'm talking about me. We give, but we don't give enough. We do, but we don't do enough. We go, but we don't go enough. You know what the joy that was set before him was? You and I. Do you know why he went to the cross? You and I. Do you know what our rejoicing will be? The scripture I read right after Brother Jimmy read that scripture. The Word of God said in John chapter 5, he said, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gather fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Do you know why we'll rejoice? Together, souls. Folk, if that's not what Christianity is all about, then I've missed the whole thing. I remember. I remember what it was like without Jesus. Consider him. Have you considered Jesus lately. You know our problem? We consider ourselves more than we do anybody else. Consider Him. Brother Joe said yesterday that Milldale is not the standard. And he's right. Milldale is not the standard of what you ought to be doing. But I can read you the standard. But ye shall receive power after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the standard for every single child of God and for every single church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider him who endured the cross but despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. I want to read you a poem that I carry in my Bible. It was written by Fred Javers, and it says this, I now protest it's not fair play. We'll face it in the judgment day. It's wrong to keep the gospel light from precious souls in heathen night. 
They have a right to hear and know we must obey our Savior's goal. If we refuse and disobey, a bitter price we'll have to pay. Friends, why do we in lands so blessed deny the light from all the rest? How dare we keep and hoard our gold while millions yet remain untold? It's sad indeed, yea, wrong and vile, to waste our fads, funds on fads and style, to leave the millions still unreached, the blessed truth of Christ unpreached. The value of a heathen soul is worth far more than all our gold. Our debt to them is overdue. They have a right to know Christ too. While countless thousands daily die, we must do more than merely sigh. The gospel's truth must meet their ear. The Savior's love must bring them cheer. The truth to us is commonplace. Oh, what a shame and great disgrace that millions still have yet to hear of Christ the Lord that we revere. The saving light must be diffused, for less than this is Christ misused. We have a debt that we must pay. Let's share the light without delay. Paul said that he was a debtor. We owe a debt. And I declare unto you in the name of the living God that if we would just consider him. Brother Ed Slaughter, when the Christian Missionary Alliance's church was founded, it was by a man named A.B. Simpson who had a burning passion for souls. And that church was birthed in Holy Ghost revival because of a passion for souls. Brother Jimmy has told me, and Brother Prather and all the brothers around here that's been here so many years, that the days that God began to stir through Mildale camp meetings was the days when men like Dr. James Stewart would come with a burden on his heart, perishing souls died, and going out into eternity, God stirs the heart of his people to give them a compassion and a love for lost and perishing souls. And I believe when the Holy Ghost of God sends revival, we will have that same passion. We will have that same zeal. And we will have that same desire to reach a lost and perishing world with the good gospel of Jesus Christ. Think, think, consider him. Consider what Christ has done for us. Consider what the gospel has done for you. How can we sit and not tell others? How can we not sit and send Bibles? How can we not sit and go to mission fields? How can we sit and not do it when we consider Him? And He said, go. And as you go, lo, I am with you always. I'll close with this illustration because I so appreciate the message this morning. Brother Jimmy's ruined my messages and sermons time after time after time. I heard a story about, a true story about a church in Philadelphia back around the turn of the century that was a great Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching, soul-winning church. It wasn't a Baptist church. This church ran some 5,000 people. Thousands were won to Christ every year out from that church, either by missionaries on foreign fields or missionaries on these fields. And there was a young man who went to the mission field sent out by that particular church that supported him for years. He went to a mission field and was on that field some 45, 50 years. Came back home side, came back to the States. That church had long since dropped his support because the church on the foreign field had grown large enough to take care of their pastor. When he came back, he went to a friend's house that he knew real well, and they used to go to that same church together. And he said, Dear brother, it's been so many years since we've even been in touch. But tonight, I want to go up to that church building and worship with those saints of God those that have given millions to missions, those that have won thousands to Christ, those that had such a passion and a burden for souls and lived in Holy Ghost revival because people had a compassion for people. I just want to go up and say thank you to them. And that friend of his said, well, the church is still up there, but they don't run 5,000 anymore. They run 
about 75 or 100. He said they don't give millions to missions anymore. They give two, three, four hundred dollars a year. They don't win thousands to Christ every year. Maybe once every three or four months somebody will get saved. And that old missionary said, could you please tell me whatever happened? And he said, dear brother, when you go up to the church tonight, just before you round the last corner, you'll see a sign. And if you read that sign, it'll tell you exactly what happened to that church and why they're not doing anything for Jesus anymore. He got in his automobile around dusk, headed up to that church, rounded the last corner, and the lights on his car caught a yellow sign with bold black letters, and the sign said this, Caution, children at play. When I was a child, I spake as a child. There was a time in my life that if anybody disagreed with me, I'd want to lash out and lash back. And I still have that tendency. But I hope to God I'm growing in grace enough year by year that when I was a child, I thought like a child. I acted like a child. I lived like a child. I talked like a child. But Paul said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Don't you reckon, beloved, it's time that we all, every one of us, got to the real business at hand and put away childish things. I suppose, Brother Harold, that more churches go out of business for God in that sense because they have caution, children at play, signs too close to their church. Let's pray.